But yeah, one of the one of the lads, the kids, we used to play football in the yard, and um, the ball would go up on the, on the public road every so often. And even though there weren't many cars coming that time, the teacher had one guy assigned to, and the ball was out to bring it in. So this day he went out for the football, but he came in with a big brown box. And it turns out there was um, there was a box full of chocolate roll cakes, Swiss roll. So there was a, an avalanche on him to, for, a, for to get a cake up and like, you know. But um, most of us got a, a cake each, a Swiss roll, and we, I mean, it was a big thing that if you get the likes of that. You, would, you wouldn't see them like that now, so. But um, in the middle of the whole thing, the, one of the girls, I think, told the teacher. So the teacher came out, but the teacher couldn't do anything because the boxes, they were half eaten at this time, you know. So that, that probably was one of the highlights in school for me, getting, getting chocolate for cakes, free. Like. And would you sometimes be looking out the window, Jimmy, thinking about all the other things you'd like to be doing? Oh yeah, I should look out in the sea. My dad was out fishing that time with a neighbour and in the Cora. And Jay, I, I couldn't wait to get out there myself, you know. So I had that thought for a while before I stopped school. So eventually the day came that I went out with my dad. I was, I was 16 and we started with lobster fishing. So that was a big deal for me. So how would that go? Tell me from when you'd get up in the morning. Oh, we got up, Daddy Jimmy got up first and he'd um, put on the fire. There was no, there was no cookers or anything at that time, just the open fire we had. And um, he'd have to light the fire. But he'd, the fire would be what we called raked the night before. That means there was ashes put over the coals and the coals waited in the ashes. And all you had to do was just stir them up in the morning, take the ashes off them and put on some turf and then he'd hang on the kettle to boil the kettle for tea and then often he'd he'd kneel every so often he'd go up on the kneel up on the chair and he'd say prayers and by the time the prayers were done the kettle was boiled so he made the tea for for us like and then if we're going to spend all day out he would make he would put tea into a, a whiskey bottle. He'd, like he'd uh, put milk in it first and then he'd put in the tea or the teapot. And he'd drop the teaspoon down into the, the snout of the bottle so that the, when the boiling tea would go in, it wouldn't blow the bottom of the bottle. That was the, that was the reason for that. And I suppose you had your own cow for your own milk? Oh, we had two cows, yeah. We have our milk most for well, most of the year, you know. When we when we run out on the cow of being calf, it'd be why we mightn't have milk, so we have to buy condensed milk in the local shop. It was in a, in a tin. I, I hated it. It was just, the taste of that good like. And whose job was it to milk the cow? So you my aunt or aunt lived with us and she would milk the cows at that stage, you know, in the morning and the evening. And would you make your own butter? Yeah, we'd make our own butter as well, yeah. We'd make it in the churn, with the churn with the handle on it. Some of them had the up and down one. So I want to get it the way you put the handle around. And my mother would put a hand in it, my aunt would put a hand in it. And then they, when they'd be so long turning, they'd lift up the lid. It was a wooden churn. They'd lift up the lid and look at the lid. And they say, it's not broke. Is it broke yet? That was a phrase he used, and I thought for a long time they were looking at the lid being broken, but it was, it was at the stage where the butter started to gather in the churn. So if they kept turning it quick, they wouldn't have any butter. So when they see the dots of butter on the, on the bottom of the lid inside, they'd slow down the turning of the handle, and eventually the butter would gather in the churn. And would they add any salt or anything like that? The salt would be taken out then with a... Uh, Two, oh, what do you call it all? Two butter spades, I think, because they were wooden. Mm. And there was a wooden dish as well. And they'd put some salt on, on, on it and they'd um, put it into the, to the wooden dish. 
and they'd shape it, square it up, and maybe put nice maps along the top of it. Mm. To designs like, you know. What did you think of that butter? It was, was nice, like, all right. Yes. And what about the buttermilk? Yeah, we drink the buttermilk then. Every day, maybe a bit. To be left in the churn. And uh, that was good too. You know. And were there any superstitions around the, the butter and... Uh, there'd be bits of superstitions I heard. I don't. I, I think if somebody came into the house, there was something about putting the bad eye or something on it and taking the butter or the churn. I heard bits like that. I didn't get to hear a lot of that, but there was a lot, lot of superstition about a lot of things. Mm. One of them was if somebody came into your house, the neighbour came in to visit, you let them out the door. They came in, you wouldn't let them out the back door because they could. Take the look out of the house. Oh. I don't know if there's any truth or not, but I hear that, you know. So So your dad would finish making the tea, then he make... would what would you would you have the cocobile or what kind of food well, yeah, would you take have, for the have, day? We'd have some bread. Now if I when I if, if we were eating in the house, you'd have bread and you'd have eggs. Homemade bread of course and eggs. You'd boil two eggs. I couldn't eat anything, only biscuits. I'd have a few biscuits, I couldn't eat in the morning. And what would you take out in the curl If we're going for the day, we'd take out a bottle of tea and some, I'd maybe have some sandwiches. But my father had a, a unique way of bringing the bread out from, you know, when the cake was made, it was a cross put in it when my aunt made it. So I kind of had four quarters on the cake, you know, when it was, yeah. So, um, Bless you. Daddy did would cut a cord, the corner out of the cake and he wouldn't cut it up in cuts. He'd cut it down straight across and he'd open it out like a huge sandwich. Oh. And he'd put butter and jam in it. That's okay if you need to sneeze. That'd be it. <laughs> and then we'd, he'd wrap a newspaper around it. It was no fancy stuff. Sounds delicious. And then you'd head out the door. Head out the door for sea. Yeah. And... Um, we be lifting lots of pots for the, for the day or most of the day. And what kind of vessel would you be in? Cora. With a little outboard engine. Went to the quintet start. Sometimes we wouldn't start, so we have to revert back to the oars. The old way, like, you know. And what time of the day do you think it was when you headed out? <clears throat> to vary now. No, meet day now would be maybe 8 o'clock in the morning. Depends on the day and the, day and the tides and all that. On a, on a Sunday morning, we did it a bit different that time because we'd go out around, I'd say, 3 o'clock. We'd, we'd have to be in for Mass. That was a big deal. We'd be in for 11.30 Mass and Tully Cross. And how would you know? So we we get up at about, he'd set the alarm, and to the alarm clock with the big... <laughs> you ever see any of them, Linda, no? <laughs> when I was small, I and remember them, yeah. Yeah. She'd wake the day, as I say. So we'd go off then, and um, we but on a Sunday morning we'd um, go out earlier because we had been, as I said, for mass. So I remember being out mornings with him, and when he'd haul up a lobster, thought he'd have to put it up between himself and the skyline to see whether a lobster in it because it still wouldn't be fully bright. So then uh, um, we had no watches. But my dad could fairly read the sun, go by the sun, and we'd be on our way up, up the bay, and he'd be saying, I think we're okay, like, you know, it's, um, it's the corner of something, we have plenty of time to get to mass, because we had no care, there's no care, so he'd cycle, but I had to walk, and that was two miles, so I turned out well out for all that. But then as we came in closer to the shore, there was always three neighbours from the village over that would pass by, they'd walk back the road to mass. There were three three men and they walked three abreast because there was no cars to bother them. They passed back our house religiously at the same time every Sunday. I think it was 10 o'clock. And there he'd see them going back. And he'd say, oh, we're okay because such and such one is going back to Mass so we have plenty of time. You know, we put the lobsters in the store pot and haul in the car and all that stuff. And was there a knack to hauling up the lobster pots? There was really. The, the, you had to haul them up fairly straight on the yard. Or the lobster, we got a, more of a chance of getting out. Because at that time, the pots didn't, couldn't hold the lobster, couldn't know as he wanted to. 
Mm -hmm. So we had to come straight over the rope that went down to the bottom that the pot was tied to and hold it up straight. And the other reason is if you didn't hold it up straight, it could get caught in the weed in the bottom. Right. And you could lose the pot, the rope broke. It could be four nylon as well. And, the and would you have to... Go ahead, sorry. Um, would you spend a lot of time repairing pots? We repair them a bit in the winter time and make new ones as well. And could you and your father do that? Yeah, both of I could do it. I learned it off him, you know. The what? rod pots were, they were made obviously from rods that was we cut in different places and brought them home on the bikes and then made the pots during the winter time. And um, then were the pots we used back then. It was before plastic came in. Do you think you'd be able to make one now? No. I um I actually never I think made a full pot. I'd make the I could put it do the top of it and the bottom of it, but I I should let him do the sides. And I never I never bothered do it, doing it. He used to do that. And then after that they were kind of obsolete because plastic pots came in and all that, so we never used them after that. I still have one of them somewhere about in the shed that he made. And were you happy when the new pots came in? Or? Oh, yeah, it was great because the rod pot really was not, it wouldn't last. And you lose, you'd lose the meat as well. The rods decayed after, they'd hardly last two years. You know, so there was a lot of, a lot of work from them. And where would you get the rods? We cut them up the road and we might go as far as Clifton or around like the frack was a great place for them. Back place called my yard, place like that. And we're going down once or twice down near Westport. And would they be naturally flexible or did you have to do something to no, them? No, they'd be naturally, you just walk them, yeah, and they'd walk away from you, yeah. yeah. And did you have any other things in the house made from the same materials? No, I had nothing else. I think down the house made from the rods, oh. only them. He did make cleaves as well for the carrying seaweed and fermier manure. We call them cleaves, they're baskets. <coughs> and we carry them on our backs. There's a small little shot of that in the field in the field. At the beginning of where the feather and sun is carrying the weed up to the field. They were the kind of baskets or with a rope around them then you carry them on your shoulder. Some guys carry them on the right shoulder, more people carry them on their left shoulder. Depending on it's like being a bit left handed and right handed. Yeah. How would you be taking seaweed up to put on the potatoes or oh, yeah, we store salted seaweed. My father would go back to the shore at night so the whole procedure. The seaweed came in with um the seaweed grew out grew out at sea, but it it was broken off with swells and things and it fell off naturally some of it. And that would come in on the shore. It would come in ahead of the tide. And then kind of in a big line, like, so he'd go back to get it. And sometimes there'd be somebody ahead of him. And whoever was there first always put a mark on it. They sometimes break up gaps in the weed that they're right on the shore and they throw a few stones on top of it. So you knew there was somebody ahead of you. So that was an unwritten law that nobody touches then. So then he'd have to go maybe back the next night or whatever. And eventually he'd get it. And it was used for fertilising whatever you're growing, I suppose. Well, you, we mostly use it for potatoes, you know. Some people put it out on the grass as well. And, um, yeah. And did you grow potatoes? Did you grow onions or anything like that? We had our own onions and, and carrots and stuff. But the main, the, main, the main dish was the potato. We saw about half an acre of potatoes, right? And about half an acre of oats. Or hens, the hens. Ah. And the potatoes we saw this year, we had the potatoes this year, you'd have the oats the next year. You knocked out the ridges, took them out, and then you put down the oats. So and you'd only do potatoes some years? No, we do them every year, but you, we, we, we go on a different patch for the potatoes oh, the see. next year. Oh, I yeah. And then the oats go there again that year. That's mm -hmm. what the procedure that they used. Mm -hmm. Crap, and we had oats and plenty of rats. Oh, the rats like the roads, oh, the rats, did they? Yeah, yeah. You know. So, <laughs> mm. last, they need to eat too, I guess. Huh? They need to eat too. Oh, they did, yeah, we were. So you had a job keeping them off the crop, probably, yeah, did you? Yeah, there were different ways of doing it, yeah. Yeah. Some people put sand in through those. I don't know if it did work or not. 
mm. very fine sea sand. They wouldn't t t t affect them to chew you see. Right. You know, but... Um, so yeah. Did you have many chickens then? We used to have about, I think, maybe 30 mm. hens and chickens. And mostly we had the moats, moats and some potatoes. And um, and would you eat the chickens and use the, the eggs? We eat the chickens there when they grow up, like, and my aunt would kill them. And they were, Your aunt was doing all sorts of things. She was, she, she was, she was my young like, yeah. Yeah. She was more an outdoor person than an indoor. Oh, okay. And she, so she liked looking after the animals, so she did the milking she and did the... the milking and she did the, she got the, the few cattle and yeah. the hens and chickens and then she killed the chickens as well and plucked them and they called them organic chickens today. Mm -hmm. And we didn't know what organic was, but they were the real deal, like, you know, mm -hmm. the best, like, so we'd have them then. And what about the lobsters? Did you eat many of the lobsters? Not really. We never bothered much with them. I don't know because when you're fishing them, you don't require a taste of them. Occasionally, and if we got what we call a schlack lobster, which means it was the one that was weak, we'd eat that one. You so know. it wouldn't go to waste, I suppose. It wouldn't go to waste, yeah. yeah. And what about fishing then? Fish, would you go out and get fish? Uh, we'd go fishing in for other fish as well, you know, and there was fish my father used to sell them. Salt them, cure them. That was before refrigeration. So they had to be up to the procedure of cleaning them, obviously washing them, putting them down in salt for so many days. And when there were so many days in the salt, they were what we call cured. So he lifted them out of the pickle and dropped dried them. They were cured for a year then or whatever. But we, when people, people, there was a lot of people that, certain people were, were really like them. So. They, they, they don't take with salt, you know, but they, they love them, like, you know, so. Sometimes they'd boil them, I think, would they? Or sometimes they'd eat them dry, I guess. No, they had to be boiled. Oh, okay. But sometimes they might boil them in three different waters to take some of the salt off them. Okay. You know. Sometimes they go to the pub and put a few pints every but... Oh, really? Yeah. And what about you? I think you black would... cow's milk. Oh. You used to call it the black cow's milk. <laughs> What about you? Did you ever, what, what age were you when you first sampled the black stuff? <laughs> How would you know that? Uh, I couldn't, I'd say I was about seven or eight. I, I used to, I used to go to confessions with my mother and for women's daddy because my mate's sight wasn't good. So I'd walk two miles to the church of her uh, when she'd be having confessions every, which was every month. And um, actually, I know she got this idea at one stage that I was ran down. So she brought me back to one of the local pubs, just back across the road from the, from the church, and she bought me a glass of Guinness. So I got the glass of Guinness, and yeah, that's the first time I tasted Guinness. I drank it, but I, she, I could see it, on the, see it on the counter with the woman inside the shop had lifted out on the counter, and like the the shop was just inside the door, and then the pub was just at the back, but they're all in the one room. So she bought the glass of Guinness out to the, to the counter at the shop where she sold bread and all that stuff. And the first person that came in was the priest. He was after hearing the conf our confessions. And he came in for something, and he still had his robes on him and all that, but he didn't see anything. So I drank it earlier, and that was grand. But uh, we went half home, walked home. And the following month, she brought me back again. Same procedure, glass of Guinness. But I don't know what happened, but I, I didn't care about the taste of it. But anyhow, we started off home, to two miles to walk home, and just coming down the road, in case I, 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 I was drunk. So I was mad drunk, I think. I was going back and over on the road like this. And I was laughing and everything, and Mammy was petrified. There's a hill there across the bay from us called the Mule Race, the height mountain in Connacht. The hill was going up and down and everything was going back and over. And Mammy said, that's the last glass of Guinness you're going to get. <laughs> and this was the, mm. that's my story. Um, my first <laughs> glass of Guinness for seconds, yeah. Well, that is great. It was so lovely chatting to you. Thank you. It was mighty entirely, as you like to say. Is it off now? No. Oh, uh, <laughs>
Mal hier entscheiden. Mal entscheiden. Das ist immer, das ist immer bestorben. Hallo.